Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event. My name is Mark Andrejcik of the Ukrainian Studies Program uh, at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, a week ago, we had a talk by Leah Batstone about Roslovitz, and we talked about um, avant-garde music in the first two decades of the 20th century and its relationship to Ukraine and Ukrainian culture of that time. Uh, and so we kind of have the second part of a double header here. Uh, we are very happy and lucky to have Professor Miroslav Shkandri presenting uh, one of his latest books uh, entitled Avant-Garde Art in Ukraine, 1910 to 1930, Contested Memory. Uh, and this is the book published by Academic Studies Press very uh, recently. Uh, and you'll get a chance and I encourage you to purchase the book. Uh, the link is supposed to be provided uh, uh, where you can do that. Um, and just a few notes on the format of today's uh, book talk. Uh, I'll briefly introduce our speaker and he'll present his book and then you'll have a chance to pose questions to our speaker uh, either through Zoom or through uh, YouTube. Um, I will field them and pass them along to, to Miroslav. Uh, so our speaker today, uh, Miroslav Skandri, is Professor Emeritus of Slavic Studies at the University of Manitoba. He's written extensively on 20th century Ukraine and is the author of, of many books uh, on the subject. Uh, I'll just list a few. Revolutionary Ukraine, 1917 to 2017. Flashpoints in History and Contemporary Memory Wars, which came out last year. Uh, the book we are presenting today, which came out last year. Uh, also, Ukrainian Nationalism, Politics, Ideology, and Literature, 1929 to 1956. Uh, Jews in Ukrainian Literature, Representations and Identity. Russia and Ukraine, Literature and the Discourse of Empire from Napoleonic to Postcolonial Times. Uh, Modernist Marxist in the Nation, Ukrainian Literary Discussion of the 1920s. Uh, he has translated uh, Mikola Kulevi's pamphlets, and it was published as The Cultural Renaissance in Ukraine, Polemical Pamphlets, 1925 to 1926, and has uh, been involved in exhibitions, uh, several exhibitions on avant-garde art in the 1920s. And today, again, we're talking about, uh, the book was published last year, Avant-Garde Art in Ukraine, 1910-1930, Contested Memory. So please, Miroslav, Professor Shkandi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and, uh, and doing this, uh, organizing this. Um, I suppose I should, uh, I should begin by just saying why I wrote the book and what I tried to achieve. Um, I began my career, my academic career, with an interest in uh, the 1920s, the literary discussion of the 1920s. And even then, I was very much interested in the, um, not just the literature, but the art as well as the politics. And, and I, I realized that something remarkable had happened in Ukraine between uh, 1910 and 1930, this explosion of creativity in, in all fields, and much of it was innovative, was avant-gardist. And so many great artists came out um, of this period uh, that I was surprised, even then I was surprised to learn that, that they were Ukrainians. So many of them were Ukrainians. Um, they made major contributions, not just in Ukraine, but in Western Europe, I mean, everybody now has heard of uh, Alexander Arkhipenko and his uh, innovative sculptures, uh, you know, the first Cubist sculptures. Uh, people know Alexandra, Alexandra Exter. Uh, people know about uh, Kazimir Malevich. But many of these, the fact that many of these people were Ukrainians has gone unnoticed. And so I, over the years, I began studying, writing these articles about these figures. And eventually this, uh, this became a book 
on the Ukraine avant-garde in those in those two decades, basically. Um, I was surprised by many things that that were not known. So, for example, it was not well known that there was a kind of a Jewish Ukrainian avant-garde uh, which interacted in the early post-revolutionary years. Uh, the famous uh, Kulturliga, uh, Jewish uh, cultural organization, uh, was was blossoming at the same time as Boychuk's school was blossoming, and there were contacts between them. There were many Jewish artists within Boychuk's school. Um, I also was fascinated by the fact that there were there was this sort of nexus between the politics and the art, art uh, both uh, looking to change the world, change change uh, Ukrainian society. And so um, I sort of started exploring there, looking at the major schools, the major styles, and this became, the articles that came out of this uh, exploration became the first part of this book that I've that I published uh, last year. But then I also looked at case studies and uh, this became more controversial because all these people, well, most of these people were identified as Russians. And so it was fascinating for me to discover that um, David Burluk, for example, not only was from Ukraine, but he was proudly Ukrainian, identified himself as Ukrainian, uh, spoke Ukrainian, uh, you know, even in New York when he was visited by people uh, from the Ukrainian community. He was, it was a pleasure for him to speak Ukrainian. Uh, Kazimir Malevich was generally identified as Russian. Oh, he's of Polish origin. And at one point when he wanted to uh, leave the Soviet Union and remain in Poland, identified himself as Polish. But in his, in his work, uh, in his um, articles in his letters, he identified himself as Ukrainian and, you know, was known uh, for his contacts with the Ukrainian art scene. Even in the last years of his life, he was, uh, he was planning to move to all his art, all, move to Kiev and gave his last exhibition in Kiev and was very close all, all the way through with Ukrainian artists. So the same can be said of uh, sculpture, sculptors, uh, 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 Kavalaritsa, a really unexplored figure, fascinating man, one of the first, um, one of the first uh, avant-garde filmmakers, uh, and a, a, a person who created his sculptures throughout his life, right to the end, uh, uh, almost to the post-Soviet period. Uh, is generally unknown. It, it's it's uh, his autobiography. His biography is generally uh, unexplored and unknown. So I I got fascinated by that. And one of the articles in the book is about Kavalerica. I also was fascinated by film, uh, Gigavertov's work in particular. Um, so that's another uh, another case study in the book in the second half of the book. There's also an article about uh, Vadim Meller, probably the greatest theater artist of the 1920s, maybe the first half of the 20th century in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I researched him, uh, went to Kiev, spoke to his daughter, got a lot of interesting information from the archives. And in this way, I sort of did, did two things in the book. The first part is a general, general issues, schools, styles. And the second part is uh, case, case histories of these figures. Um, well, one of the questions they always get asked whenever I talk about the book or, or this, this, this uh, period in art is uh, why, did it happen in Ukraine? Why was the avant-garde so uh, such a fruitful development in Ukraine? 
I think this, that's a very big question. It could be answered in different ways. But Ukraine was ready for change. Ukraine was uh, modernizing. And Ukrainian artists were in touch with Europe far more than is generally, uh, generally suspected. They traveled to Europe. They spent time in Paris, Vienna, Munich, Berlin. They were schooled. It was normal for people to uh, finish their schooling uh, in these Western European cities. And they did courses, they, did, they, they, they attended studios there. There was far more traffic east-west and west-east than uh, we, we now, we generally suspect. And so if you look at the biographies of these, these people, they were in Western Europe, they were swarming through these cities and they took a big, they played a big role in the development of the Western avant-garde. Exter, for example, is uh, credited with bringing color to, uh, to the, uh, the cubism uh, in Western Europe. Uh, you know, Malevich was, uh, was in uh, Berlin. Uh, Tatlin was in Paris, supposedly even visited uh, uh, Picasso's studio, although that may be apocryphal. So, there was, first of all, there was a big, uh, a, a big a f a fascination in Ukraine with modernism and the avant-garde. Secondly, they, uh, there was this idea that Ukraine had to take its place uh, at the high, cultural high table of Europe. And Ukraine brought certain things to this high table. One of them, was um, this fascination with primitivism, with folklore, with folk arts, with the icon. And this made Ukrainian art different and, and special in, in many ways. Uh, the icon, the folk art had been looked down upon until around about 1910, when some of the first big exhibitions were organized by Ukrainians uh, not just in Ukraine, but in Moscow and abroad. And all of a sudden people discovered that the icon was not sooty and dark as some people suspected, but was vibra colored vibrantly. Um, they began theorizing, uh, discussing the, the icon and the, there was sort of an explosion of interest in the folk, the primitive, um, and Ukrainians were in the forefront there. Um, one of the other questions they always get asked is, uh, in what way was this art Ukrainian? I mean, how can you possibly call it Ukrainian avant-garde? It was Russian, wasn't it? It was in the Russian empire. Well, there are different ways of answering this. First of all, as I've mentioned, many of these artists self-identified as Ukrainians and it's worth, uh, spending some time thinking about that. The autobiographies of Kazimir Malevich, for example, um, explain that he came from Ukraine. Ukrainian, Ukrainian art and life had the major impact on him. And he really sort of um, uh, identified with this local culture. That autobiography, the, the, actually two autobiographies that he wrote, very often is edited. And the parts that are edited out are often the bits that discuss the importance of his Ukrainian upbringing. So there's a self-identification. It's the same with uh, Burluk. It's the same with uh, a, a number of these major artists. You know, even Sonia Deloney, who left Ukraine when she was a child uh, of six, uh, even in her uh, later, later uh, descriptions of her own work, spoke about the importance of her upbringing in Ukraine. So that's one aspect of why uh, people should look a little more carefully at this, um, at the Ukrainianness of these artists. But that's not all. There's also the, uh, the, the problem of 
what part, what group of artists, what movement did they participate in? And as you study this avant-garde, you discover that these Ukrainians were in touch with one another. Even when they lived in Moscow or lived in Paris, they were part of these clubs, uh, these groups, they, 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 uh, they uh, met, they corresponded, they uh, worked together, they did exhibitions together. So the links between these artists were uh, far stronger than we suspect. And also um, the third aspect of this is the Ukrainian sensibility. Now this is the hardest thing really to nail down. It's, uh, man, we have to be fairly careful and a little speculative, but there are certain things about the art itself that uh, are distinct, are different from say Russian art um, or Polish or Polish avant-garde or the, you know, the Czech or, or other avant-gardes. And you know, what I try to do in the book is to, is to look at some aspects of this, uh, this unique sensibility. Now I'm not, I, I was not in the book trying to sort of uh, claim that these artists were exclusively Ukrainian because in the reality, in, in, in the, the reality in which they lived, the Russian Empire, Western Europe, Central Europe, you know, they were they were primarily artists and avant-gardists, and they contributed to different schools, so they can be claimed. I mean, some of them lived in Moscow, and they can be claimed as part of the Russian avant-garde, at the same time as being part of the Ukrainian avant-garde. If they were of Jewish origin, they can be claimed by three groups. And so recently when there have been exhibitions of avant-garde art, say French in France, in Paris, uh, there have been exhibitions of the Jewish avant-garde in, in Paris, the Ukrainian avant-garde in Paris, the Russian avant-garde in Paris. And there are certainly links between, between these people. So some of the artists can, although they came from Ukraine, they might have been Jewish, they may have spent time in Russia, they can be claimed by three different avant-garde. I wanted to say that so that people didn't think that I was uh, uh, being excessively essentialist um, and, uh, and exclusive, exclusivist uh, and only claiming that these people were Ukrainian. But this aspect of the art to me was, um, was something that needed exploring and something that I tried to bring to the fore. Should I carry on? Uh, I can say a few words about the, um, what I think might be a unique sensibility that these people brought. Um, it's speculative, as I said, but First of all, there was this delight in craftsmanship, skill, craftsmanship, something that uh, that one art critic called a modesty artisanal, artisanal modesty. They really came out of an artisanal tradition. So uh, Tatlin, for example, made his own banduras. And you know, there's a great amount of skill involved in that. Uh, this love of materials, this uh, this ability to 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 work with certain uh, certain uh, 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 materials that have that have certain qualities. Uh, this uh, was also stressed by uh, Burluk and and by uh, Boychuk, uh, the sort of uh, 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 finger memories and, and 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 understanding that comes out of the fingers working with things. It seems to me that, uh, that um, there was a less of a metaphysical angst about these um, these this, the artists in Ukraine. They were less obsessed with world changing theories. Um, Yes, there was a visionary component, but it was more about breakthroughs in perception. 
And there was a certain sort of mysticism, but it was more linked to the earth, nature. There's a wonderful story that uh, Archipenko tells when he was a child growing up in Kiev. He would uh, uh, walk to school um, and he would pass one of those stepovi babe, one of those um, uh, step uh, uh, stone sculptures, ancient, nobody quite knows how ancient they are from the step. It's now on the front steps of the Kiev National Museum. And he would, uh, as a child, actually climb up on it, he says, and he would uh, play on it. But in the evening, when it was dark and he was returning, he would avoid it. He was frightened of it. There was something mystical, mysterious, frightening about this, this, uh, this monstrous looking sculpture. And I think that's uh, sort of this, this idea of the earth as being mysterious, the, the, the cosmos as being mysterious and powerful and having secrets is very much a part of this, not only Archipenko's sensibility, but of many of these, these artists. Um, they, they, they had this sort of link to, the, to nature and to the powers of nature. Burluk is another uh, example of this, uh, a very strong one, by the way. And I think that's one of the keys to understanding him. In my article, I speak about Burluk as a son of the steppe. Uh, he clear, he definitely was a, uh, had a mystical streak in him. Even in New York, when he was painting the, you know, the Hudson River, he would paint uh, radio waves, which he claimed he could see in the sky. Uh, this sort uh, of <laughs> mystical perception of of uh, of the world around him. Um, also very different among Ukrainians uh, and very special is this, uh, what the, the critic Nakov called euphorie coloriste, uh, a, a color euphoria. Uh, anybody who knows anything about Ukrainian folk arts is aware the, of this love of color, which is uh, spectacular. And, uh, and so people grew up with. Malevich grew up with this. He also grew up with this fascination for the ability of ordinary people to paint their walls. Uh, Ukrainian houses are whitewashed and then painted, uh, various designs painted on them. And these are symbolic designs. These are stylizations of little birds or stylizations of little animals. And Malevich discusses how uh, you know, the, these colors and these, these stylized forms influenced him as a small child. So this colorism, uh, which Ukrainians were very proud of, the avant-garde was very proud of, they brought, they felt that they had brought this to Europe. Um, there was less fascination among, in the Ukrainian avant-garde with technology, with the machine, and particularly with this idea of mastering nature. On the contrary, Ukrainians, it seems to me, I'm, I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, but it seems to me that Ukrainians were far more interested in learning from the powers of nature rather than this obsession with conquering nature. Uh, something that we now look at, uh, when we look at the avant-garde, we can be critical of. There is also this um, less fascination with marching columns, the rhythms of these, uh, you know, s s soldiers of from the factories marching to the future. Uh, even in the children's literature or the uh, uh, illustrations for children's books, which were very, very popular at the time, and many major artists, particularly in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, uh, contributed to, even in those illustrations, they they downplay uh, the um, the marching columns. You know these uh, cohorts, uh, these uh, these uh, 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 disciplined masses of of people. Instead, you have more of a personal lyricism. 
uh, more of an exploration of, um, of, uh, of a, a personal attitude. Uh, it's a gentler uh, sensibility. Well, we could explore why, think about why that is, and we could talk about individual um, artists and their contributions. I could uh, give you some of my insights based on uh, the, um, the research that I did, but um, I think maybe it'd be interesting for you to ask me questions. Uh, we could take it from there. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the introduction there. Uh, I've read your book in it. Th there's certainly a lot of things. I learned a lot of, I learned a lot. <laughs> and uh, I know you've been working on this, this idea of kind of opening up the possibility of also recognizing this art and these artists as not just being Russian or Soviet, as is the norm, but at least allowing for this possibility for them to be Ukrainian as well. Uh, this is not your first endeavor, this book that is you know, towards that goal. I mean, you've written much about this and been involved in uh, several exhibits. Uh, in fact, I was lucky to see in Hamilton, uh, the exhibit I think was brought over from, from Winnipeg, right? That you were involved in it's have right. the catalog right here. Right. Uh, so my question to begin with is based on having been working on this, you know, for, for almost two de decades, uh, have you noticed that people, is there a growing willingness over the years to allow uh, us to look at this uh, as being Ukrainian. And I'm talking about people, experts in the field, people that lecture and write about Soviet Russian avant-garde. Has it, has it gotten any better? Uh, and if not, uh, why? And what will this latest uh, publication of yours, this, this work of yours, how, how can that help uh, to- right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I understand. Um, I think uh, there was a time, particularly when I first uh, got a job as a professor and began writing and thinking about this, when uh, Ukrainian avant-garde was, was viewed as an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ukrainians, all they do is sing and dance. They're peasants. You know, this sort of crude, uh, understanding of uh, what Ukrainian culture is. And also, it, I mean, it's a colonial imperialist understanding, uh, put down, if you like. But I think that there were always good scholars who were uh, quite aware of the biographies initially of some of these people. Uh, John Bolt, for example, and they were sensitive to the fact that really this was more a Russian Ukrainian avant-garde and this term Russian Ukrainian uh, began to appear in scholarship uh, around about the time that uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm -hmm. But with the opening of uh, archives with the with these kinds of exhibitions appearing uh, I think there has been a change. That book that you showed and that exhibition that we did uh, that was, I think, the first time in North America that the, uh, you, the art from Kiev, from the Kiev National Museum were, was, was, uh, was displayed. Uh, it was all avant-garde stuff. And I think that did have an effect as did other exhibitions, similar exhibitions that took place in Europe and other places. Um, and you know, the more people write about these things, the more the more uh, people are aware uh, of what of what had occurred. I was at, I was attacked in some letters initially, even for for writing Malevich's name in a certain way. You know, uh, uh, transliterating from Ukrainian or suggesting that he was Ukrainian. This, this seemed ridiculous to some people at the time, but no longer so. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really has, the, the landscape has changed. 
it's been a long process and it's not me, it's, it's a sort of a generational thing. When uh, the, one of the leading uh, art historians in Ukraine, Dmitro Horbachev, uh, began working with the uh, National Art Museum in Kiev, the major museum in Kiev, he discovered in the basement, and you can go find it even now, behind chains and locked iron doors, a so-called Spetsfond, a special fund, where all the art uh, of the, from the, up until the early thirties, the avant-garde art had been taken, put on rollers very often and thrown in a corner. And it had survived because in spite of various directives from the communist leadership, the Soviet leadership uh, to destroy this art, successive generations of curators had refused to do so. Generally saying that, oh, this was bought by on the money of the people, this was bought, we cannot destroy this or they would take another tack. They would call it, they would give it a zero qualification, which meant no artistic value. Wrap it up and throw it in a corner and, and leave it to be forgotten. So when I was there, uh, I understood that Gorbachev was one of the first people to discover this, begin bringing these works out gradually. Mm -hmm. Even in the, uh, the, the, the major art uh, book, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the History of Ukrainian Art, multi-volume, he actually got some illustr photographs, illustrations of Boychuk school works into that book without naming them. So in a sneaky way, he began introducing this stuff. And I, when I was there, I found, um, what, what uh, I call the doomsday book. Every single art, um, piece of art that had been avant-garde art that had been confiscated in the thirties was recorded in a so-called doomsday book. There's about 1,200 pieces. Uh, most of these were then thrown into that Spetsfond basement, that cellar and in the columns, there was given a reason why. Uh, one reason was bourgeois nationalism. Another reason was formalism. Uh, a third reason was um, enemy of the people. Enemy of the people was a euphemism for the artists that had been executed. And uh, you can actually read this book. Somebody one day should publish it and see uh, what happened to this to this avant-garde art? Well, after 1991, all of a sudden exhibitions began appearing. Uh, there are even um, annual conferences devoted to certain certain um, figures. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a much better understanding of what what had happened in the 1920s and 30s, and I think this rubbed off on Western scholars. Uh, as well as the exhibitions that were shown. So today it's a very different landscape and a very different understanding of, um, of uh, this, this um, cultural phenomenon that, uh, that happened in the 20s. That's good to hear. Um, I'd like to say that well, we're opening up um, to questions, please submit your questions and I'll uh, read them to our speaker. But I, I had another question. Uh, one a particular joy uh, I experienced reading this book was uh, learning about uh, somewhat like quirky facts about some of these uh, very famous people. Um, or maybe I just was ignorant of them. I didn't know that Buluk was interested in Yuri Kosach's prose, for example, uh, and that Henry Miller was a fan of <laughs> uh, not of course, right. unfortunately, but of Buluk. <laughs> um, and that 
his father was apparently the, the model for the hefty shirtless Kozak in the famous reply. Yeah. Was well, <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to take Burluk with a grain of salt. Yeah. Uh, he was a, a self promoter, a wonderful self promoter. I mean, this is a man who, without any knowledge of any English or Japanese, for that matter, he moved uh, across Siberia. Uh, uh, making his way by selling art along the way, then went to Japan, uh, sold art, made enough money uh, to come to the United States. And then in the United States, uh, painted his face, uh, wore a top hat and his famous waistcoat and, and earring mm -hmm. and opened up shows to, 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 be, to, to tell the world that the, the genius Burluk had arrived in New York. He survived. But he, now, the thing about his um, the thing about his uh, Ukrainianism is uh, uh, is startling because he uh, he did in fact uh, uh, claim to the first of all he it's his claim in the family they claimed that his father was the model for that uh, semi naked Cossack mm -hmm. in Repin's painting. Zaporozhians uh, write a letter to the Tur Sultan of Turkey. Uh, he also was extremely uh, proud of the fact that he was of Zaporozhian origin. In, a, in, a, in other words, his, his family came from the Zaporozhian, from Zaporozhian background. Um, and uh, a fellow artist, uh, a, a Czech artist, Fiala, who married uh, Boychuk's uh, sister, produced a uh, family tree, which has the, uh, at the bottom of the tree, the Zaporozhian, and then has uh, branches with all family members moving, moving in different directions. I discovered that in Syracuse, in the Syracuse archives. Burluk's archive, or a large part of it, is in Syracuse University. And that is there. That's something that needs republishing. I also discovered uh, a postcard from uh, Miller, Henry Miller, saying that he had been mesmerized by, by when he saw Burguk's uh, paintings of uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian villages, and uh, this sort of nostalgic memory of childhood in Ukraine, which Burguk constantly returned to these brightly colored rural scenes which he which he was which he could never forget so yeah you have to take look with a little bit of uh, uh, skepticism but certainly all that's there and it's you know the, the the pieces of that puzzle have not been put together there is a case to be made that he was very Ukrainian I don't know if I, if you've heard this story, but when I was in New York, I was talking to Pani Radish, 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 mm -hmm. who was the uh, librarian at the uh, Uvan, the Ukrainian uh, Academy of Sciences. She was the daughter of a professor called Miyakovsky, and she told me that one day her father and she went to visit Burluk in Brooklyn. They knocked, they didn't have a clue. They, they were a bit uh, worried about what the response might be. But Boluk's wife answered the door. And when she found out that these, that they were Ukrainian, she said, oh, my, my husband, speaking Russian, of course, my husband is a Ukrainian. He will be delighted to talk to you. And they sat down and talked to Boluk, who spoke perfectly good Ukrainian. Tim. So somewhere in the Uban archives, I've I told this story more than once, there's got to be a tape of Boruk speaking Ukrainian, being interviewed in Ukraine. It would be fascinating, I think, to find if it's still recoverable. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And there's plenty more interesting facts uh, in the book that we could talk about, but I'd like to get to some of these questions that are coming in now. Um, go Guillermo Munoz asks, uh, when was this connection between Ukrainian artists living in Ukraine and the rest of U Europe severed? 
Was it in line with the rest of the Soviet Union or was it allowed for a longer period? What foreign works allowed, were foreign works allowed any more than in say Leningrad? Uh, it's a little bit different. Basically, it follows the same periodization, if you want to call it that. It's a little bit different because the avant-garde survived longer in Kiev and Kharkiv than it did in uh, Le Leningrad and Moscow. And in fact, that's one reason why Malevich moved to Kiev to the... Um, Art Institute and lectured there from 1928 to 1930. And that's also why his last theoretical works appeared in a Ukrainian journal there, in Ukrainian actually. So there was a, a little bit of a delay. The avant-garde survived a, a art, art, well, not just art, but literary avant-garde as well, survived a little bit longer in, uh, in Ukraine. But the severing of contacts, yes, that was pretty much um, later 20s um, and uh, already 27 people were finding it more difficult to connect, to travel. Uh, you had to be, you had to have special permission. So Malevich got special permission to travel to Warsaw and then Berlin. And actually he, painted many of his uh, many works for the Berlin exhibition when he was in, when he was abroad and showed them in Berlin, which is why uh, they have survived there. They are now in Western Europe, a large number of them. Uh, but it was, um, yeah, the cutoff was sort of the, the, the mid to later twenties. Um, uh, everything was very controlled by them. And, uh, Artists that found themselves on one side or the other side were not able to travel as easily after that. Uh, Elena Martinuk writes, thank you for eliminating book uh, and the questions. First, since avant-garde is such a multifaceted notion that each new book seems to add more to its definition, did you feel like after writing the book that your impression of the avant-garde changed, for instance? I recently heard a talk on Boychuk by Konstantin Akinsha, who declared that Boychuk is not an avant-gardist, but a retrospectivist. Would you disagree? Did your research have you reconsider some of your early ideas? And then just to follow up, why have you not included separate chapters on Exter and Bohomazov? Do you plan on working on? Yeah, uh, no, it's a multifaceted phenomenon uh, by, its, by its very nature. I mean, when you explore, try to find new ways of perceiving the world, um, you're, you're, you're sort of um, going out on a limb and you're exploring your own, through your own inspiration. So yes, it went in different directions. These people, these movements uh, integrate many different uh, kinds of uh, developments. Uh, so I, I would agree that, uh, that uh, a great deal more needs to be done and all these things need exploring. Uh, Boychuk comes up all the time. Uh, he, his ins original inspiration was, you know, the Renaissance, the icon um, and, uh, and Western Ukrainian folk arts, folk, folk uh, painting. But uh, in my chapter on Burluk and the poster art, I point out that the revolutionary poster from 1919 to 1922 was very much uh, a product of that Boychuk school. And simultaneously, the uh, Kulturliga and the Jewish avant-garde was doing their thing. You know, they were next door to each other uh, and they were actually in contact, the Kulturliga and the Boychuk school were in contact with one another. So if you're going to eliminate Boychuk, you're really then, you're going to have to eliminate the Kulturliga. Um, the inspiration for both 
was a linking of the past, the, the present and the future. In other words, let's go to the deep past, the, the forgotten past, the original archetypes, the ancient traditions, in order to create something new. Let's find something unique and special uh, that has been long neglected. And this idea of a revival based on the past was something that both the Jewish avant-garde and the Ukrainian avant-garde shared. Now it's not that difficult to make a connection to <clears throat> the discovery of African or Polynesian art. I mean, you go back into the past and it's all new again. African masks, you know, Polynesian crafts. That is ancient. That is going into tradition, ancient traditions, but it is renewing it in, in the modern context, exploring uh, something ancient to, to make it new. So I would argue that, yeah, Bolchuk is different. And certainly his, um, his explorations of form were uh, in many ways actually a foil to the, to the avant-garde. Uh, he was not a fan of some of the wilder uh, you know, futurist uh, experiments, but they all came out of a similar kind of a, uh, uh, interchange uh, discussion about art. And Boychuk argued with Malevich in those last two years in Kiev. They had a lot of discussions, a lot of arguments. Uh, Malevich said Boychuk's, you know, recovery of the, of the ancient frescoes is, uh, is foolish. It is like painting Ramesses II on the telephone. Uh, but you'll also be aware that Malevich suddenly at that point turned to these Renaissance portraits. He began producing Renaissance portraiture. And it has been argued by some critics that this is the influence of Malevich, uh, of, uh, of Boychuk on Malevich. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it goes in different ways, in different directions. And it was a dynamic, evolving, ever changing. Um, sphere, uh, uh, this avant-garde. Um, different people are influenced by different things. And why, uh, the second part, why no case studies on uh, Bohomazov or Exter in your book? Why did you focus on those five particular artists? Um, because I could, that was something I had access to. That was some, some there were some materials that I could, I could get. Bohamazov needs a, a, a monograph. Um, uh, Miroslava Mudrak uh, has uh, access to some of the, the, the materials that he produced and he produced an awful lot of theoretical work, which nobody has read. Uh, nobody has if nobody has published that uh, that uh, requires a, a, a particular individual effort by someone and it's there it's there for the taking as is so much um, I mean each of these people are deserving of a book and uh, all I tried to do was to sort of um, stimulate people's appetites ask questions and indicate possible uh, future uh, avenues of research. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have two questions now coming in from the other side. Question for, from Armando Solorzano. Uh, would you say the Vertov's aesthetic has non-objective qualities in Malevich's sense? And is there an affinity between montage theory and Marxist relational epistemology? Avant-garde artists, were often called cosmopolitan in the USSR. Was that an anti-Jewish attack? Oh, there's a lot of issues here. A lot uh, that could be said. Um, uh, well, it depends at what period, who's saying what, when. Cosmopolitanism became a, uh, a term of uh, abuse. It's uh, definitely anti-Semitic. Anti uh, particularly 
uh, later uh, in the 30s and 40s and into the 50s. But um, uh, it depends when it's being used uh, because it, there was initially uh, this idea that artists had no or communists had no nationality. They were, you know, space age people uh, with no national attributes. Uh, that changed very quickly, but because for many people it meant you had to be Russian. Uh, Russian was neutral. Anything else was nationalism. Um, it, it initially, some of the avant-gardists felt that cosmopolitanism was a good thing, but it, it would change very, very quickly. Um, I think that there's a, yeah, each of these artists needs to be looked at very carefully and perhaps a deconstructivist approach would work for a lot of them because there are more, thing, more than one thing going on in, in their work. So with Ziga Vertov, for example, there are, there, there, there are con contradictory inf influences. And in my article on Vertov, I try and point out that he was mm, blending or he was being pushed in uh, simultaneously in different directions. So uh, yes, he was trying to uh, create a sort of an objectivist world. Um, he was uh, fascinated by um, the, uh, the power of the lens to tell a story, um, an objective story, a, a story without any uh, preconditions. But at the same time, he was editing he was shaping, he was, you know, forcing a certain uh, uh, viewpoint into his work. And so that's one contradiction. If you look at his uh, 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 inspiration, is that what I call enthusiasm? I distinguish three different kinds of enthusiasm. And these were all powerful, uh, at the time, there was an enthusiasm for the Ukrainian national revival. You know, look at Vertov's film, there's all these Ukrainian texts in there. There's all these Ukrainian references, uh, Ukrainian books, Ukrainian conferences. Um, you know, there's a sort of a, a, a understanding that Ukrainians at the time were building a Soviet, but Ukrainian communist culture. Then there's this fascination with Stalinism. This, uh, these enormous skyscrapers and massive factories and these, these um, uh, chimneys which dwarf people. So the creation of a powerful industry in which the individual is a cog, uh, this is, this is very Stalinist. And this is part of that sort of fascination with the proletarian, the enthusiasm for proletarian culture. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's an, another contradiction. These things don't blend uh, quite, quite, quite blend together. They're not easy to, uh, to, uh, to reconcile one with the other. And there are moments in, in uh, Vertov's film where uh, they, there's a tension uh, between them. Um, you know, the, the, the proletarian as the, as, the, as the hero, the strong man. But then I think also right at the end of the film, you, there's a sort of a, uh, a reflex reaction to this. Uh, I detect, for example, a sort of a slightly uh, bemused, uh, maybe even cynical approach. If you look at the portrayal of uh, the factory, the, you know, these, these great workers uh, doing wonderful things, melting steel and creating things, 
look at the factory conditions. They are appallingly dangerous. It is frightening. Um, you know, this suggests something different. Look at the faces of the people who are driven into those processions. The way they snicker at the camera or look as askance, they know they're being photographed. They know they're being herded. Um, look at the dance scene at the end where these happy peasants at, after the harvest go around uh, doing presyatke, you know, uh, the, 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 the Cossack dance. I don't even know what that word is in English, but doing the, uh, the up and down Cossack movement. This is at the time when collectivization is taking place and uh, just before the famine. So there's a certain kind of, um, the certain kind of distancing that is already apparent. And what I'm suggesting is if you analyze carefully these, these uh, films, uh, uh, Vertov's inspiration is more complicated than we give it credit for. Okay, uh, we're starting to run out of time, but I'd like to get to some more questions. This is a long one, but uh, kind of conceptual, going back to what we started with. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Alexander Boskovich. Thank you organizers for this event and thank you Professor Skandri for this important contribution. What makes the artworks and artists you discuss in your book particularly Ukrainian? Having in mind the pronounced political, ideological progressiveness and internationalism of the avant-garde art, it seems paradoxical to claim that their national sentiments or attachments played an important role, unless that was one of the key components of their poetics or optics. It looks to me that the argument based on their self-identification as Ukrainians or collaboration with Ukrainian fellow artists, Ukrainian sensibility uh, doesn't do. For example, the lighting craftsmanship and love of materials is far away from being an exclusive feature of, of artists sharing Ukrainian sensibility. Uh, Arkipenko, Tatlin, and Boluk's son of the steppe. And also this love of color would make any French followist or any interwar outside artist from the Balkans a barrier of Ukrainian uh, sensibility. In other words, how productive is it to look for national features within the avant-garde production? Well, no, I mean, that's a, a valid point. Uh, and I tried to say that these things have to be um, treated, you know, with a, a degree of um, care. But would you say that Polish avant-garde was different from Russian or French or German? Would you say that the Czech avant-garde was different. I think they are. And I think if you look at them, there are certain features that figure more strongly uh, than others. And to answer your original point, if there's anything Ukrainian avant-gardists were obsessed with, it is with being international and being recognized in an international framework. So this idea of internationalism, it's not just the avant-garde, it's the modernist generation that preceded the avant-garde. The modernists who were in Paris, who were in uh, Berlin and Munich and Warsaw and Krakow, they wanted to sort of assimilate the international trends. They wanted to become part of Europe. And uh, the idea was, yes, we will bring our contribution to this international movement. There is no contradiction between internationalism and this idea of being national, especially for uh, a, a, a nation that's oppressed, uh, has been oppressed and wants to be recognized, um, its contributions recognized. So um, a bit more complicated than just either or. I'm more interested in the both and rather than the either or. And I think that's maybe a, a way of answering your question. Thank you. Uh, well, we're basically out of time. Are you, do we have time for one more question, uh, Professor Skundi, or do you need to go? No, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I'm uh, anonymous attendee, can you talk a bit about where you think the turn to mysticism and nature was derived from? Shiroya. Well, whoa, Ukrainians have this uh, strange fascination with the mystical. Um, 
And I think it's probably to do with the connections through, uh, through these sort of ancient folk arts to, uh, to a distant past. Um, uh, you know, the symbolism uh, on the Easter egg, the, the Pisanka, uh, the symbolism in, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the folk stories that they, they tell, the, these are of ancient origin and they, uh, the rituals that have survived are pre-Christian rituals in the Ukrainian tradition. So I think that's one place to look. There's also this fascination with the earth. Uh, I mean, all this beekeeping uh, the Ukrainians <laughs> are famous for, all this sort of uh, uh, worship of nature uh, has, has, a, has a connection uh, to, to, the, to the distant past. And these are things that, that Ukrainians um, explore even today uh, in, in their art. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I'll tell you what though, I was shocked to discover that Burluk, when he lived in the Kherson steppes, he, as soon as he found out there was a haunted house, he would ask if he could spend the night there. And he would go and he would sit there waiting and hoping to see a ghost. Uh, this was uh, told by his son in, <clears throat> in the archives, the son's, uh, the son's uh, uh, memoirs are, are there. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's always this, this idea of, uh, of a, a cosmos that uh, has stories to tell that we, we haven't yet found. Buruk also would go digging in the steps, uh, the, the Kurhane, the ancient mounds. I would pull out uh, endless numbers of skeletons and, and uh, uh, metal and pottery, which he found there, Scythian artifacts. I mean, you'd get arrested for trying to do that today. But in those days, he, he amassed a, a huge museum, uh, part of which he dragged to Moscow, including these stone sculptures which he took from the from the steppe so this also shows you this uh you know att attempt to communicate with a distant past and sort of mystical sense of union with something very 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 ancient so i th there's a wealth of exploration here uh, uh bohomazov is another figure who could who who had this uh idea of movement as, uh, as uh, mis mysterious and mystical. When a train goes down a street, it, the, the movement of the train affects the vision of, of the, the buildings. The buildings begin to change, begin to ch change shape even. Uh, and, and he had the sort of feeling that this, uh, uh, the perceptions changed because of the movement of uh, one, one object. Uh, in a scene. So there's, there's lots to be done there. Okay, we'll have one more question and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, William Bodhi asks, how does Isaac Babel fit or not fit into the literary contested memory? He wrote in Russian, French, and Ukrainian. Uh, oops, and it just disappeared, <laughs> the rest of the question. So does he uh, belong to what? what well, uh, literature is a little bit different. Uh, generally, if somebody writes in a, in a language, then they're claimed uh, by that liter literature. But the Jewish writers from Odessa uh, lived in a Ukrainian reality. And if you analyze carefully, or if you read carefully their works, there is a Ukrainian dimension to them. Uh, Babel, for example, wrote about uh, the experiences of the Red Army in what was Galicia at the time, uh, uh, Western Ukraine. Uh, he also, you know, had this sort of uh, uh, understanding of the complexities of Jewish, Ukrainian, Polish relations. Um, another uh, fascinating artist is Bogritsky. And there you have a very strong connection to the Ukrainian tradition. I, I, wrote, I wrote, write about this in my other book, the U Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, Pogorsky uses the 
poetry of Shevchenko, the same meter, the same organization. And he talks about this sort of uh, Ukrainian Russian uh, confrontation during the uh, the uh, during the the revolution. This is an homage to Shevchenko. This is an homage to Ukrainian literature. I think if you look carefully at some of some of these um, these works, there is more there than meets the eye. Now, if you're only a Russian specialist, if you're only uh, studying Russian literature, and if your focus is via St. Petersburg and Moscow, the revolution uh, as it is, uh, as it took place there, or as it uh, uh, is written about from there, you will not know this, you will not see this. But if you know Ukrainian literature, you begin noticing things uh, that are different in the, much the same way as Jewish writers uh, sort of recover the Jewishness of certain authors because they know Jewish tradition and they can detect, they can read uh, subtexts in uh, literary works. So, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a un relatively unexplored phenomenon, but uh, particularly the Odessa school, uh, I, I would say there's quite a lot there that, that is Ukrainian and can be analyzed as such. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up now, but I uh, want to thank everybody who, who listened and watched us for the last hour or so uh, and for your questions. I want to encourage everybody to purchase uh, this book again. Uh, the link is available on, on the website. Uh, it's Academic Studies Press. And uh, finally, I want to thank Professor Miroslav Shkandri for, uh, for writing this book and for discussing it today uh, with me and with our listeners, viewers. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. And this will be available on YouTube uh, shortly, this, this whole uh, presentation. Thank you again for everyone.